Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for finding time and attending today's webinar, Smart and Programmable Sponges from Design and Synthesis to Implementation. My name is Jeff Kenvin, and I'm Technical Director at Micromerdix Instrument Corporation, a global leader in material characterization technology. I'll be your moderator for today. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Omar Farah. Before we start, let me explain how you can raise questions. If you have any questions on the content uh, presented, uh, please write them in the chat window in our Q&A, and we'll answer those in the Q&A session at the end of the webinar. Uh, the webinar recording will be available on our webinar landing page, so make, you, make sure you check back in about five to ten days. But you'll also be provided a link to the recorded webinar via email once available. Uh, now let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce today's speaker, Professor Omar Farah, who um, who's joining us from Northwestern University today as a special guest seminar. Um, with this for a special guest seminar, um, his talk will be "Smart and Programmable Sponges from Design and Synthesis to Implementation." Uh, Professor Farah, his current research spans diverse areas of chemistry and material science ranging from energy and defense to related challenges. Specifically, his research focuses on rational design of metal organic frameworks for applications, sensing, catalysis, storage, separations, and water purification. Um, Professor Farah has enjoyed many awards um, with his career, um, numerous publications with a really impressive H index, uh, a great indication of how his peers view his work. Uh, he's also quite the entrepreneur with uh, his company, Numat Technologies. Um, I'm handing it over now to Professor Farha now to learn more about smart and programmable sponges from design and synthesis to implementation. Thanks, Jeff. While we're trying to uh, get the slides up, so thank you for everyone that's taking the time out of their busy schedule uh, to attend uh, the webinar, uh, and hopefully uh, you'll enjoy it, and we could have some discussion at the end answering some of your questions. So, Jeff, if you allow me to actually uh, share my slides, uh, this way we could start. Can everybody see my slides? Jeff, is my slides are up and fine? Yes, your slides are on the screen. They look great. All right, thank you. So, you know, of course, uh, I'm going to be talking, but just to make sure it's clear, I don't do the work. I'm just a spokesperson for the Farha Group. This is the talented uh, group of uh, researchers, undergrads, grads, postdocs, uh, research scientists, uh, visitors who come to our group at Northwestern University to do uh, some uh, in incredible projects that they come up with these ideas on their own and they make us all together look good. And I always say, if you surround yourself with the smart people, you never have to worry about running out of ideas. Uh, the funding agencies are just as important because without the funding, we wouldn't be able to do uh, the research itself. And from the title, you know what I'm gonna be talking about today. It's Metal Organic Framework. And, uh, you know, it's from uh, also from the name. You know, it's built from metal ions and clusters, organic linkers. And I always say, we don't make supramolecular assemblies we make materials that two and three dimensional uh, infinite uh, networks. Uh, I personally like working with these materials and decided to actually uh, do that as a career uh, is because the diversity. You have a, a, a periodic table to pick from, uh, some cheap, some expensive, uh, and you have a couple hundred years worth of organic chemistry to pick from uh, something like uh, a benzene dicarboxylic acids, all the way to more complex and sophisticated linkers. And I'm going to start here by saying, you know, people say uh, MOFs are expensive. Yes, they can be expensive. 
but they also could be very cheap. So it depends what metal, what linkers do you choose. It can be either very expensive or very cheap, and you cannot generalize are moths cheap because not all moths are cheap. And at the same time, you cannot generalize that moths are expensive because not all moths are expensive. Uh, these materials, because you build them from self-assembly, that means they are programmable and you scale them. And I always say moths are very special except when it comes to scalability. It's like their cousins, zeolites. If you are able to scale up zeolites, you could scale up metal, you know, metal organic frameworks if the application is there and the application is needed. Uh, and a small uh, startup company of about 30, 35 employees uh, were able to scale up metal organic frameworks and already commercialize it uh, worldwide uh, in the electronic industry. But because of this diversity, that allows you to make materials that they are diverse in many uh, aspects, the chemical aspects, the physical aspects, uh, the ability to be able to make materials with large cavities, small windows, small win uh, large windows, small cavities, and uh, so on and so forth, which means that becomes intriguing from many applications, catalysis, storage, separation, and anything in between. But more importantly than that, the ability to be able to get single crystals and then resolve these single crystals to get structures knowing these structures down to the atomic level and angstrom level and where an OH is and where an amine is allows you to have a heterogeneous material but acts like and behaves like a single molecule and there is not many families of heterogeneous families at least molecule uh, that can be tailored the way a small molecule can be tailored but at the same time it behaves as a heterogeneous materials in my group, we work on the gas storage, verification uh, uh, technologies, happy to answer some of that during Q&A. We also work on a uh, catalysis uh, and not just uh, the detoxification of, uh, you, know, you know, toxic chemicals. We work on Department of Energy related applications in the heterogeneous world. We also stabilize nature's catalyst, which is the enzymes uh, to do certain transformations. But we also don't forget about the bottom of the periodic table, the actinides. And I'm not going to be talking about why we are interested in actinide-based moths. But if somebody's inter interested in knowing more, happy to discuss this during Q&A. For today, I want to concentrate on the moth enzyme composites and why is that important uh, technology and why I do think it's going to be uh, something useful in the future. We are now on a slide that starts with a cover from the CNE magazine. And this cover was put about a couple years ago, uh, talking about 100 years since World War I. And why I'm telling you about what's happening in World War I, because that's really where things started using super toxic chemicals against humans in a way. Uh, and you might ask yourself, you know, that, that happened more than 100 years. Why are we still talking about it? I'm not going to even get into that discussion, you just go simply Google and you'll find out what's been happening in the last five years. So we don't have to go even back to, to, to 100 years ago. It's things are happening in the last uh, five to two years. Uh, what's our representative toxic chemicals? This is a couple, uh, I would say one of the most toxic chemicals like a GD or a VX. And the mechanism of the toxicity comes, we all humans have an enzyme called uh, acetylcholine esterase. Its job to take that neurotransmitter acetylcholine and really break it into pieces uh, once an action is done. That means uh, you say, uh, okay, Omar, lift this cup. I lift this cup and once I am done, uh, then this enzyme does its job by making me stop, keep lifting that cup. Uh, but there is an issue here when, uh, an, you know, when the, uh, one of those toxic chemicals comes and binds to where the catalysis happened inside the acetylcholine esterase, uh, and it, you know, it binds irreversibly. At that point, you have no control over your action, and you keep lifting the cup up, uh, up and down, and you cannot stop. But in this case, <clears throat> you will have absolutely no control over your muscles, over your breathing, and very quickly leads to death. 
the detoxification of those chemicals is really simple if you think about it, but complex to implement. You want to be able to uh, cleave that PF bond into that POH bond because that's the PF bond that binds, I mean, very reactive into the active site of that enzyme. And once you cleave it, you know, there is, I can't say the product is super not toxic because there is no such a thing. Every chemical has its toxicity, but the thing is not going to kill you as fast as what a, a GD or a VX will, uh, will do. So <clears throat> the way to go about it, if I was giving another talk, I would have told you how we design MOFs to do this job. But for today, I want to tell you how we stabilize enzymes that does this job. And there is an enzyme, it's called a, a phosphate triesterase, a, and it, this enzyme it's found in bacteria, a, and in this bacteria living in farming land, and it actually does a great job at degrade, degrading nerve agents. A, and it's a, if you look at this slide here, it has the active site. It's built between two zincs, bridged by hydroxyls, some histidines and carboxylic acids. Yeah, I am making it simple, but this is a really complex uh, you know, active site. So what we decided to do is how can we take that enzyme and stabilize it? So why is that important? I don't want to tell you why, in, but if you could do that, then you could go into areas beyond just the defense area because enzymes are highly selective high, uh, and the acceleration rates are uh, tremendous. But the challenge taking these enzymes to do the catalysis is if you try to run this catalysis uh, outside the comfort zone of enzymes, such as temperature, uh, pHs, uh, if there is a dry uh, season, then they dehydrate. And once they dehydrate and high pHs and temperatures, then they denature and stop working. Uh, one proposed solution is how can we, uh, you know, take these enzymes and encapsulate them uh, in metal organic frameworks. Uh, and here, uh, what I'm showing on this slide is taking the enzyme after you build the metal organic framework and putting them together. And you might ask, uh, is that a new technology? And the answer, no, there is not even one single solid uh, phase uh, material that has not been used to immobilize enzymes. But I'm going to show you that MOFs have a special properties that other materials do not. And I'm happy to discuss this during a uh, QA. and a So our design principle uh, here was, if you could build a material or a MOF that has two channels, one is larger than the other. And why is that important? Because we want to be able to put the enzyme where uh, in the large channels, but not in the small channels. And we want to be able to get uh, you know, let's say uh, the starting materials to diffuse through uh, the, uh, the small channels and the windows. So those channels are connected by windows and the products to diffuse out. So here we try to make uh, an honest to God hierarchical material. The enzyme go one place, the starting material and the product comes from a different place. This way you have no diffusion issues uh, whatsoever. So on this slide, what I'm showing you is, you know, our thinking from the beginning, uh, what a, a topology or a MOF material would look like, at least in a PowerPoint chemistry, uh, it would look like something like this. You have a hexagons and triangles, and you have some windows in between. But I always say this is PowerPoint chemistry. How can we translate this PowerPoint chemistry into actual reality? But before I tell you that, I want to tell you that we also want to make these materials from very stable coordination chemistry because we know the enzymes are unstable, so we cannot just take them and put them in also MOFs that they are unstable. We want to take unstable enzymes and put them in MOFs that they are very stable under different conditions in order to make very stable composites. So we decided to, we chose a zirconium a base MOFs. And what I'm showing you here is a 12 connected zirconium cluster. What does that mean? You have a zirconium six, uh, it's like almost like a nano zirconia capped by 12 uh, benzoic acid. So anytime I use the word connected, uh, that means the number of carboxylic acids around this six zirconium. 
And if I am going to lower numbers than 12, 12 is the maximum in this case. If I go to a lower like 10 or eight or six, that means for every missing carboxylic acid I have there, it's gonna be balanced by a water and a hydroxyl group. Just leave that in mind. Uh, so how do we build these materials? Uh, the, the one I showed you a few minutes ago, the hexagons and the triangles, but I also told you that these zirconium-6 clusters can be used as a building block. And here you could say, we could go from 12 connected to four connected and anything in between. Even when you think about 12 connected, it can, it can be also different geometries. But what I'm showing you here is a geometric entities, but that can translate very quickly into a, you know, a, a molecules, technically. These are discrete uh, molecules, and here you could see how they look like once you have the number, the right number of carboxylic acids around them. And if anybody has any questions about the synthesis of some of these molecules, happy to discuss this during Q&A. <clears throat> we could do the same thing with the organic linker. Uh, once again, this organic linker, I'm showing them here from two connected, for example, benzene dicarboxylic acid into a more complex six connected, for example. But even in the six connected world, <clears throat> you could see there is many ways that you could connect uh, six uh, connectivities. How do you translate that to an actual molecule? These are the molecules that can represent what, I'm show what I showed you in the previous slide uh, in geometric entities. Now we could start thinking about these as Legos. Take the right geometric entities, but choose the right components, the building blocks, and you could technically uh, build these sophisticated complexes or uh, metal organic frameworks, but you're really starting from simple uh, building blocks. And this is uh, the first MOF I wanna show you. Uh, uh, some of you guys already know this material, NU1000, it's built from pyrene tetraphenyl tetracarboxylic acid with a zirconium-6, but it's only connected uh, through eight connections, not the 12 connections. We make quite a bit of it here at Northwestern because we wanna test it for a few applications. This is the actual crystal structure. This is not just a rendering uh, in ChemDraw or other programs. This is an actual crystal structure. And you could see we have now the hexagons, we have the triangle. On the side here, what I'm showing you, these are the walls between the hexagons and the triangles, and these are the windows. Uh, this is, a, a, I'm not sure if this movie is playing, but this is a movie or an animation showing you if you dive in into this metal organic framework, and you could see these are the windows that is sitting uh, right, uh, right there. So moving on, we decided to start first with an enzyme called QNAs. Even though I told you we wanna use it for the Department of Defense, we didn't start there because we are not an enzymologist and we wanted to start with an enzyme that we could really buy from uh, Aldridge and buy it very cheaply. We could make a lot of the MOFs, but we don't wanna start with an enzyme that somebody worked hard at. We wanna start with an enzyme that you could really make as many mistakes as you want until you learn, then we could go into the more sophisticated and complex uh, enzymes. So this is how uh, technically it looks like. I mean, we don't have a crystal structure of the enzyme inside the MOFs, but I hope to show you some evidence that exactly we, the enzyme is, sits in the hexa, hexagons and not in the triangles. You know, we know that uh, that's how it's gonna be because we're starting with an enzyme that is larger than the triangles, but it should fit in the hexagon. So it's no surprise that it shouldn't go to the triangle. How uh, we do that post synthetically, that means we make them off first and under the right pHs. A, a, and the right charges on the surface of the enzyme, the right charges inside the MOF, we pick the right conditions that we make the environment of the MOF very inviting and the enzyme diffuse and it doesn't uh, leach out. We could also monitor the diffusion of these enzymes by using a confocal and we could uh, tag those enzymes with a chromophores and really watch them go into the crystals. And what do you see here? The, the larger the crystals, the longer the diffusion. And more importantly, what do you see? That the diffusion happening from the two ends of the crystals, not the sides. And that makes total sense. 
because the sites, that's where the windows are. And the windows are too small for the enzyme to diffuse. And only the hexagons come from the uh, two ends of the crystals. And that's where you see the diffusion of the enzyme. <clears throat> now, how do we know that the enzyme is only sitting uh, in the cavities? I mean, uh, we are, in my group, we mainly use uh, sorption rigs that coming from micromeretics. And this is an example of an isotherm that we collect. So if you look at the top right, the black is NU1000 without uh, having the enzyme in it. And you could see that step around 0.2 P over P naught. And that's an indicator for a mesoporous uh, channel or cavity around, let's say, 3 or 3.2 nanometers. The red one is after we put the enzyme into a uh, metal organic frameworks. From the isotherms, you could extract a few pieces of information. One of them is the pore size distribution. The second thing is the surface area. And the third thing is the pore volume. So if you take these isotherms with the right equations, the, then you could take what I'm showing you on the bottom, the pore size distribution. And what do you see in the black uh, spectra? You see that you have the two uh, peaks. One is around 1.2 nanometer and one is about three. That's the small and the large cavities. But look what happened after we put the enzyme, which is indicator in the red one, that nothing happened from really the small channel. Most of the reduction came almost half of the pore volume in the large channels uh, disappeared. And it didn't really disappear. It's now occupied by this enzyme. So now we know where the enzyme is. <clears throat> Does it work? Does it do the catalysis that it's supposed to? So this is the reaction that this enzyme does. It takes a, this ester and cleave it into the acid, and we monitor the production of this nitrophenol with UV-Vis. Uh, and it works quite well. So you could see the composite is working. It, it takes off versus if you have NU1000 by itself, or if you remove the composite, the reaction stops, which means this is a heterogeneous uh, material. But more importantly, we wanted to study the stability of this material, not just does it work. And this material likes to be in detergent. So that means if you do this reaction without detergent, you could see the composite is doing better than uh, the homogeneous uh, enzyme. Now let's start challenging this enzyme. And if you think about it, urea is the kiss of death for enzymes. It, it, it undo the hydrogen bonding, then they unfold and they denature. And here you could see our composite doesn't get affected versus the free enzyme gets killed. More importantly, you could start adding a, you know, a organic solvent and you could see the composite works. The free enzyme dies very quickly. More importantly, you could start recycling these materials while you could maintain the turnover frequency and anytime you recycle these materials, you are gaining turnover numbers. That means we stabilize the enzyme enough that we could recycle it and it works just as well as when we uh, started. Now let's go to the enzyme that the Department of Defense cares about. The first thing we did, if you look at the enzyme uh, kinetic diameter, about 4.4, you, you could tell very quickly uh, if we use NU1000 is not going to work. It's too small. So we had to go and make another MOF and uh, it's we, it's with an extended linker. I'm not going to bore you. We do the same thing. We put it inside uh, the channels of the MOF the way we did it in NU1000. Uh, and after that, we do the catalysis. So this is what we call a simulant or a surrogate. That means uh, it's uh, safe enough for us to work with it at Northwestern. Again, there is chemicals are not safe. Every chemical you choose, you have to have respect for it. Even though it's a simulant, we still have to do it in the hood, uh, in the pro under the proper conditions. But it's it's not get a, it's not doesn't have the toxicity as the actual agent. So we take it, and what we could see in red that we we monitor with phosphorus NMR that the starting material is disappearing and the product is appearing. So this catalyst is competent, but we know it's competent because the enzyme does this very well. Now let's see how it works. This is the background. That means that's what the buffer does or the MOF itself. It's about 10% or so conversion. 
if you think about the free enzyme, <clears throat> it's the blue spectra, and it's a very active enzyme. If we take our composite, uh, what do you see here? is when I, I always say when I put this slide up that we have good news and we have bad news. The good news, if you wait 30 minutes, uh, we will reach uh, the same uh, efficiency as the free enzyme, but look at the initial rate. The initial rate of our composite is very, very sluggish compared to the initial rate of the uh, heterogeneous catalyst. That's something, obviously there is a diffusion issue, there is a crystal size issue that we have to address, and I'll show you in a few slides how did we address that. But let's talk about the stability. What we decided to do is you take this particular enzyme and the composite and put them at different temperatures for uh, 25 to 30 minutes, then do the catalysis. And very quickly, you could see that the composite, after you get to certain temperature, it lasts a lot longer and it's a lot more stable than the free enzyme. More importantly, if you want to ship these enzymes around the world, shipping them in freezers is not the ideal way. So what we decided to do is take our composite and uh, you know, uh, filter it, take the enzyme and lophilize it and put them at room temperature. And every day we test uh, the activity of uh, these materials. By day four, I don't have the data here, uh, very much our composite did not really uh, lose much of its activity versus the free enzyme was completely dead. Then we send this material to uh, the army labs and what do you see here on day zero and day 50 the activity of the composite did not change so you could start seeing day seven that it went down. It didn't really go down because by day 50 it went back up again. These are different technicians in different days, and this is just the human error uh, in these kind of measurements. All right, how can we do better uh, uh, when we're talking about the initial rates? You know, two ways you could do that, make this small, uh, the, you know, the triangle and the windows larger for things to diffuse faster, and make the crystallites smaller, then you could uh, speed the, uh, you know, the diffusion. And we did both, and we made NU1003 in this case, so it has larger uh, windows, triangles, and uh, we were able to make, uh, uh, you know, diff I'm not going to bore you with that. We put the enzyme the same way as I showed you for the first uh, couple enzymes uh, that we put it after uh, post-synthetically after we make them off. It goes into the hexagon, but not the triangle. Now, let, uh, we also, beyond making the you know the triangle and the windows larger, we also decided to go and make smaller uh, crystallites. And here, what do you see that we are able to go from 300 nanometer to about 10 microns and anything in between, almost monodisperse. You could look at the PXRD and everything looks uh, what it's supposed to be. That means we are making uh, clean uh, materials. But more importantly, uh, when you are dealing with porous materials and crystalline materials, just showing the PXRD alone is not good enough because the PXRD is going to tell you only what's crystalline. And if you have anything amorphous, you're not going to see it. And that's where we have to do nitrogen isotherm. And you could see here in the bottom corner that all the material, it doesn't matter what's the size, they have identical uh, nitrogen isotherms which as it should be. Uh, that means uh, we are making the same material uh, and uh, it, it's pure, it doesn't have amorphous phases and it doesn't have any other crystalline phases either. And uh, one thing you could see uh, that the step uh, in this particular spectra, nitrogen isotherm, that is shifted to about 0.4 P over P naught. If you remember in NU1000, the step was around 0.2. So it's shifting to higher and higher P over P naught because we are making larger and larger mesoporous channels. And that makes sense where the condensation of nitrogen is going to happen. Now let's go and do the catalysis. If you do the hydrolysis here, what I'm showing you at the beginning is uh, on the bottom, 
that just the background, the top is the homogeneous. If we do the large uh, crystallites, uh, we've seen something similar. If you make the crystallite smaller, it gets better. If you ma make the crystallite smaller still, it gets better. And we go to the 300 nanometer, it gets quite interesting. And uh, here, those lines are not really kinetic traces. These are just to aid your eye to what points going with what. If you look at the uh, black trace, you will see that now we have something interesting. We are making our composite, beside it has the stability, now it has higher uh, and faster initial rate kinetics and catalysis than the free uh, enzyme. Happy to discuss what are our thinking about this during Q&A if anybody has any questions. Now we send this material to the army labs and they get exactly what we see that our composite, the 300 nanometer composite, it's three times faster initial rate than the free enzyme. This is exciting guys, because we're not just making the enzyme more stable to last longer. We also somehow, we are making it more reactive than the free enzyme in the solution. In the last few minutes, this way I could have plenty of time for Q&A, uh, you know, enzymologists will tell you, you know, not all enzymes have only a, a substrate and the enzyme and that's it. A lot of reactions require actually substrate, enzyme, and a coenzyme to coexist together for the reaction to take place. And a lot of time, those coenzymes are quite large. So here I'm showing you. So we decided to use LDH as a, a model system to be able to show that we could do that. We could do this catalysis of an enzyme and a coenzyme. And NADH, you could see this molecule right here, it's quite a large molecule. A diffusing hydrogen, nitrogen, argon into MOFs and other porous materials is one thing. Diffusing this organic molecule in channels is a different uh, issue that we have to address. But also, it's been shown, you could see in the bottom of this uh, slide, that the mechanism for this reaction uh, to take a uh, pyruvate to lactate is very well known. And you need to have the enzyme, the coenzyme, and the substrate in close proximity for this reaction to take place. Uh, this is another rendering how big this molecule is. I'm trying just to show you. Uh, this way, when you compare MOF to other porous materials, think about the tunability and your ability to diffuse a, a CO2 molecule, but at the same time being able to diffuse a coenzyme such the molecule I'm showing you here. So if you do only a PowerPoint chemistry, that's easy. You could take the small figure and keep stretching it, and you will get to the largest figure I'm showing on this slide, and that should be large enough to diffuse you know, whatever you want. The question is, how can we now take this PowerPoint chemistry and convert it to reality? For some of you guys on this call who work with metal organic framework, they know that sometimes just picking the right uh, ligand with 4-carboxylic acid, it doesn't guarantee that you get to get the right topology. But we were able to figure out that the rotation around the phenyl that has the carboxylic acid determines everything. And if you are between 55 and 65 degrees, you can get the topology we want or the CSQ net in a way with zirconium moss. Happy to discuss this, uh, uh, <clears throat> but for the time, uh, we don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna dive deeper in that. Uh, in collaboration with Sir Fraser Starter, my colleague at Northwestern, we were able to make all these molecules uh, and we make all these uh, MOFs uh, and we could match uh, that they are pure uh, to the simulated PXRD to the actual uh, material we made. More importantly, these are the structures. So you could see we made, we started with NU1000, now we have NU1007. 
uh, NU-1000 had a, a three nanometer hexagons, and now we are about seven nanometer hexagon. The interesting thing is, how does this now shows uh, it shows up in nitrogen isotherm? So here, what I'm showing you this slide that you have all six nitrogen isotherm for the materials we made. If you look in the bottom, that's NU1000, that's the first MOF we started with. It has one step in the mesoporous, it's about 0.2 P over P naught. Then we went to the second one and the P over P naught shifted a little. But after that, going to NU1005 and higher, you start to see two steps and those steps starting to shift with respect to pressure. So why do we see two steps? The reason we see two steps, because now both the hexagon and the triangle, both are in the mesoporous regime. That means if we don't see two steps in the nitrogen isotherms, that means we did something wrong or we didn't activate our material uh, properly. <clears throat> we take this material and we put LDH. This is just a representation. It's a cartoon. It's not a crystal structure. How do we monitor the reaction? We monitor the reaction here. We take you know, our composites and the free enzymes as well. We go from pyruvate to lactate, and we need to use a, a non-fluorescent molecule that fluoresces upon, uh, you know, upon doing the catalysis and it doesn't return back. Why is that important? That means we could monitor the fluorescence of this molecule, and the more a uh, number of molecules that fluoresces, that's higher catalysis, higher efficiency, and we could start counting <clears throat> how our materials are doing. This is the summary. Uh, the one that, you know, the spectra with the stars here, that shows if you have a homogeneous sample, everything in solution. So it does quite well. If you have material that you have diffusion issues, that means the channels are smaller, uh, that means the catalysis is sluggish. And by the way, just to take out the particle size here, most of these materials, or all these materials actually, uh, in the MOF, we, we make them around one micron. This way, the particle size does not contribute into the diffusion differences. But now, when we go to the top three, or the largest three, that means we made the channels, that triangle, and the window's large enough, you could see that again, that we are making our catalysis, once again, the initial rate faster than the homogeneous catalyst. And that's very intriguing. So we didn't, the first time we thought we got lucky with the, you know, the, the enzyme that degrades nerve agents that we made a material that is more catalytically active than the free enzyme. But once again, when we go now to even a different uh, reaction, a different enzyme, we see that again, once you remove diffusion problems, our composite has a faster initial rate than the free enzyme. So with that, uh, I hope I was able to show you that enzymes are incredible materials. MOFs are very interesting materials, but once you put them together, you could do a, a incredible chemistry. And we really, us and others in the field, just scratch the surface in this technology. And I hope to see more new people coming into the MOF world working uh, into uh, on enzymes and MOF composites. Uh, with that, I, I want to thank you for waking up early if you are uh, around this part of the world or if it's late, if you are on the other side of the world, uh, to listen to me for the last 40 minutes. I want to uh, thank uh, Micromoretics for being a wonderful partner uh, and thank Jeff for the invitation and allowing me to talk about what our group uh, does in this particular project. And thank you. Omar, thank you very much for uh, the wonderful talk this morning. Um, I'm opening up the chat for everyone's questions. Um, we already have a few on this. Um, at the start of your presentation, you said very nicely how you really have the entire periodic table to, exp uh, to explore. 
how do you start looking for a new moth? Um, is it a lot of modeling? Is it bench work, intuition? <laughs> Which uh, are the I would say all the, all the above, but let me tell you how we work in my group. We don't really uh, mix things and pray to God to see what God is going to give us, then shop it around for an application. Uh, we do similar thing to what organic chemists do. You know, when they have a, a you know, let's say a natural product and they, they do a retrosynthesis, we do that, but our retrosynthesis is a little different. Uh, we start with the application. And from there, we decide what's the properties that this material has to have in order for us to tackle that application. Then we go into the moth and the components. What kind of components we need uh, to build that material to do these tasks? Uh, and that's, where, that's after that, we go and we decide, okay, uh, how many connectivities does it have? What metal do we need to choose? Then we need to understand, uh, really, what's the environment? Uh, if we're doing things in water, then we need to make sure that we are dealing with moths that they are stable in water, because not all moths are stable in water. If we're dealing in certain impurities that the impurity has acidic impurity, SO2s, or basic impurities like ammonia, then you need to make your moth with these type of coordinates, certain coordinations to give you that. The modeling has been uh, great, and we've been uh, we collaborate with a lot of modelers and theorists here, both at Northwestern uh, and outside Northwestern. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so that can help a lot, uh, but it's still, in my view, nothing is gonna. You know, we still have to, as experimentalists, we have to think about everything that surrounds that moth and is going to touch the moth before we go ahead and make that moth. Okay. So uh, one area, you've been very successful commercializing moths, and someone has asked, do you perform some accelerated long-term testing, something that sort of simulates aging? Uh, of course. <clears throat> and the reason for that, because, uh, for example, the cylinders we are selling you know, those are guaranteed for many, many years. And if you go to uh, our uh, partners who uh, distribute uh, our product, you could see how many years they are, uh, they should last. And you don't have five, six, seven years to do testings. The only way you get to get to the answer is to do accelerated uh, testings to, to make sure that uh, the material inside your cylinder will last for four, five, six years, or whatever the number of years uh, DOT requires, and uh, that you could fill and empty that cylinder as many times as the application requires in these many years as well. So um, near the end of your application, you showed these uh, beautiful materials where you've basically designed them to have a hierarchical system. Um, do you have an estimate of what the largest, and I sort of refer to it as an engineered mesoporous material, do you have some estimate of what the largest pore size you may be able to synthesize uh, for mesopores? <clears throat> I, I don't know, to be honest with you. I think your limit here comes to two things. One is uh, how much time do you want to spend making uh, and how many steps you want your organic linkers to be. Uh, I, I here I'm assuming you want to make large mesoporous ordered, not based on let me hit it with a light or let me uh, break some bonds and get some random mesoporosity. We're talking about a crystalline mesoporosity. Uh, it really depends how much uh, time you want to spend. The second thing is, you know, making the moth is one thing, making the linker the linker is one thing. You could collaborate with the right people or hire the right people, they will make it. Making the moth is, you know, a tiny bit more challenging task. But really at the end, can you activate that moth? And what do I mean by, can you remove the guest molecules, solvent, and you're still maintaining that mesoporosity from, you know, just uh, getting crushed? Uh, and that's the biggest question mark. If you want to do that in gas phase type of chemistry. However, 
if you're not going to do it in a gas phase chemistry, you're doing everything in the liquid phase, then it doesn't matter removing the gas solvent. You could always exchange them. And at that point, I would say the sky is the limit. It's just how much patience you have and how many organic step uh, in your reaction synthesis you are willing to tolerate. So our next question is on chemical separations. Um, have you worked on the alkene, alkane separations? We did, and actually one of our early papers that everybody, <clears throat> uh, you know, interesting in the literature, people forget things very quickly and they uh, rediscover things every few years. Uh, so yeah, we publish a, a nice Angevante Chemie, uh, you know, with Randy Snur, uh, showing how different metals, uh, while maintaining the right, the same size channel, uh, can really modulate uh, the selectivity uh, very well, and you could get into phenomena that has not been seen before. Right now, it's been seen uh, because we showed that it has been, it, it can be done. Uh, but yeah, we worked on that quite a bit. We're, we're still interested in that, but in a different way. We like to do it now in a, a how want to say, in a reactive uh, uh, separation method and not just a, a, a typical separation uh, because we believe it might be easier to do it that way. But we are interested in both. Okay. So um, there are Two, two uh, people have asked really similar questions, um, so I'll, I'll bundle them together. Um, one of them is, how do you know the enzyme is stable inside of the moth? And then how do you choose enzyme and pore size uh, for these to go together for the stability? <clears throat> sure. Uh, so the, let me tackle the second one first. I mean, if you looked here, the enzyme is very much a close match to the channel. And the reason for that, because one mechanism of enzyme degradation is unfolding. If you don't give the enzyme the space to unfold, then you, it's got to maintain its structure. Okay, how do we know that the enzyme is not dying inside the cavity? You know, because we could uh, do, uh, we run certain reactions and control experiments, unless you have the folded and intact enzyme, that reaction would not take place. And we know when we have a, a dead enzyme, and when we know when we have an active enzyme. And even sometimes what we do, we could uh, pull the enzyme back out and really test it in a homogeneous sense again and see how the enzyme behaves. Um, staying with that in your your nice piece on uh, the enzymes in the moths. The next question is about the particle size. What are the general ways of making the moth particle sizes smaller or larger? <clears throat> you know, different moth families, there is different techniques. I'm going to speak to the one, uh, the family we are dealing with here, which is the zirconium. It's really uh, uh, time, temperature, and modulators. What do I mean by modulators is the monocarboxylic acid uh, that you add to the system to slow down the crystallization. Uh, the pKa uh, matters, and uh, so sometimes you might, I showed that one slide, uh, but that one slide took about four to six months to be able to get a really good uh, experimental procedures to be able to do that and do it very well. So it's not like we just could walk into the lab and say, yes, we want to make a uh, annu 1006, 500 nanometers, go right ahead and do it. There is, uh, we still have to do certain screenings and optimize uh, our, you know, uh, our reaction conditions. So I, I wish I have a catalog of but since we've been doing that for a while now, we, we, don't, we don't start from scratch. We have a good idea uh, what solvent to use, what temperature, what modulator to start with. It doesn't mean it's going to give me the right answer, but at least it would be a good starting point. So staying with these materials, um, we have a question on, were you able to observe any flexibility rotation of ligands in the windows of the NU 
uh, 1,005 and above? <clears throat> Uh, you know, flexibility, I would be surprised if they don't have any. These are large ligands. Uh, and so, yeah, they should have some flexibility. We didn't really study it. Uh, and we didn't really dive deep into to see what the fennels around those uh, by the windows. But even if there is a rotation of those fennels around the windows would not matter because those channel, the windows... Uh, like NU 1007, uh, these windows become about more than two nanometers. Yeah, a small rotation of a fennel ring is not going to matter. Uh, if you have something that is about seven, eight uh, angstroms, and you have two, three fennels that rotate, uh, the uh, organization of those rotations is going to matter at the end. But in these cases, when you go to large uh, channels and windows that doesn't get to play a big role or at least we didn't see it but the flexibility I think it's going to be there and I hope somebody will study it so uh, the next one really isn't a question it, it's a request and that is a request and a comment uh, can you please repeat your explanation why the caged enzymes are faster than the free enzymes and the comment was that's awesome uh, thank you for the comment, <clears throat> and I didn't really explain why, because I, for the time, we really have three theories uh, that we are working on, and we're trying to collect. That's why I didn't really talk about it, because it would be nice to have uh, to have theories and explanations, but it's even better if you have evidence to support your theories. So let me tell you the theories that we have. One is, you know, in, free enzymes like to aggregate. Even though we are counting every enzyme in solution, they like to aggregate and they aggregate very quickly. Maybe they just aggregate and precipitate uh, fast. Uh, in the channels, <clears throat> I am a Middle Eastern, so I like to use the shish kebab example. They line up like a shish kebab inside uh, that channel. And I didn't talk about it here. And we showed that more than 95% of those enzymes are accessible and active. Uh, take my word for it, I could spend a whole lecture on that. So that's one explanation is the accessibility. The second thing is really <clears throat> uh, in solution, uh, the, or, you know, the substrates are distributed in a certain concentration in your whole entire vial. But those, those substrates can uh, you might have a higher concentration inside the channels than outside, which means if you have higher concentration of your substrate, your reactivity is going to go up. And we are seeing, we have evidence now to support that. But also, <clears throat> we have evidence to support you might be stabilizing a more reactive configuration of the active site of the enzyme inside the channels than outside. We are in the process of writing a paper right now that uh, it hints in some cases, not all cases, we might be seeing that. Okay. So the next question is about economics and what's interesting, they always <laughs> come into play. How economically viable is it to make such a big linker for commercialization? What do you want to use it for? That's the, at the end of the day. We, what do you want to use it for and how much somebody, what is going to do and how much somebody is willing to pay for it? In a lot of uh, enzymatic reactions is actually, even with those large ligand, those MOFs and their price is nothing compared to some of the enzymes and the amount of time people make and... Uh, you know, engineer the active sites uh, and do a lot with it. Uh, and they have certain smaller quantities. So in that case, the enzyme is actually more expensive than our material. And if you are able uh, to stabilize the enzyme for, you know, let's say 10 times longer or 100 times longer or 1,000 times longer, then financially it makes total sense. If you're planning to use these materials to save somebody's life, because now you're stabilizing 
an enzyme that destroy nerve agents or use them as an antidote, you know, uh, to me, if the moth is costing $10 a kilo, or if the moth is costing $1,000 a kilo, it's not going to matter if there is somebody's life on the line. So are those biggest moths, one day we got to put them in a tank uh, to store methane, that you need 50 kilos to fill a tank of a car? Most likely not, because you're not going to reach the right price. But for the right application, yes, there should be a place for them and the and people willing to pay the extra buck for it. So the next question is concerning synthesis. Um, is phase purity a problem in synthesizing the zirconia acetate, considering how many um, connectivity options are available that you showed in, showed in the presentation? <clears throat> sure. Uh, I think that's where the linker design becomes to be important. Because the linker design is a lot of times will dictate and lead the geometry of your MOF. And at that point, you could make the four connected or the 12 connected based on what linker you choose. Uh, so it's not always uh, the SPU or the metal cluster that dictates uh, what's the topology at the end. Okay. Um how do you estimate the quantity of enzyme to load into your MOF? Uh, <clears throat> ICP. Uh, a lot of, uh, there is cert, you know, like, uh, let's say if you take sulfur, we don't have any sulfur in our MOFs. The only sulfur comes from the enzyme, and we know how many amino acids that have that sulfur, and then we know how many enzymes uh, per a gram of MOF. And this way, when we are comparing different uh, MOFs, we're not just choosing, uh, I want to use one milligram of a MOF. No, no, no. We make sure that the amount of enzyme in that MOF, in that reaction, all the same in all materials and in all reactions. Okay. So we're almost out of time this morning. So this will be the final question. Um, how did you activate these mesoporous MOFs before the adsorption measurement? Um, do they follow the same activation protocol? Uh, most of them, uh, NU1000, the first, the first couple, it doesn't really matter. You could do it with just solvent exchange and heat. The, the, the top five, they were activated supercritically. That's something, uh, uh, you know, was the technique was developed at Northwestern. Uh, we use it, we love it. Others in the field use it and love it. And in this case, we it, it was very crucial. So, um, so thank you. Um, um, you know, we're, we're out of time this morning. Uh, Omar, I would just like to ask, do you have any final comments um, you'd like to make before we close out this morning's webinar? No, I mean, uh, this was wonderful. Uh, I hope... Uh, really the audience were able to see that sorption matters. Uh, PXRDs and, uh, is important, but you need to get the, uh, the isotherms in order to make sure whatever you call it, uh, an, uh, you know, your material is great and pure, that it's really great and pure uh, by getting, uh, and you activate it, you didn't collapse thing. So doing the right sorption measurement is very crucial and uh, you know, if people have any questions, obviously they could contact me, they could contact Micromoretics about uh, what the appropriate instruments for doing certain measurements. So once again, Omar, thank you very much. Thank you for everyone that attended this morning and took time from their busy schedule. Um, it was a wonderful webinar. Uh, it, it always reminds me of why I love science so much uh, to, to listen to these types of presentations. Uh, once again, for everyone, please check back for upcoming webinars. Uh, again, uh, the current webinar will be posted in, in the next week to 10 days for everyone if you'd like to rewatch it. And again, we hope to all see you again very soon. Thank you and have a good day.